first fireside chat, and it's my pleasure to have with me this evening Ed Sim to kick off the series. Ed has been making seed and first round investments in enterprise technology in New York since the mid-90s. He began his VC career in 1996 with Prospect Street Ventures, subsequently co-founded Don Trader Ventures in 98, and founded Bolstar Ventures in 2010. Some of his market-leading investments include one of the first big data platforms, Greenplum, which sold to EMC, early SaaS pioneers go to my PC, which sold to Citrix and is now Citrix Online, Live Person, which is now an $800 million market cap public company, and some of his more recent investments from Bullstart One include GoInstant, which sold to Salesforce, Blaze.io, which sold to Akamai, and Reportive, which sold to LinkedIn. Ed is an active blogger at beyonddc.com, and you can follow him at EdSim on Twitter. In our talk this evening, we're going to get insights from someone who has real experience in the space. He's not just jumping on the bandwagon saying enterprise tech is cool now, but he's been doing this since the 90s in New York. Ed and I will speak on a variety of topics, and then I'll open it up to questions from the crowd. So if anyone has questions throughout, please tweet them in with the hashtag at NYETM, and we'll make sure that we answer them. So to kick things off, welcome. How about you tell us about, uh, I heard that you're in the process of closing a new fund. So could you walk us through what that process is like, how large the fund is, and what size investments you'll be making? Sure. Well, before we do that, I, I want everyone who has a beer in their hand to kind of put it up in the air for St. Patty's Day. <laughs> and, and, I'm, I'm not, and also for, for Jonathan. I think it's freaking awesome what he's doing here, uh, building out an enterprise tech community in New York. Uh, it's been sorely needed. Everyone talks about digital media, this, digital media, that. That's pretty cool and fun to use, but enterprise tech is where the money's at. That's and that's what sets it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Woo! Jonathan is just proud here. Yeah. We're just going to build the next big company, all right? Where, where's your beer? You're Irish. You're good. It's <laughs> too fast. So, so yeah, thanks. We, we, um, I started Bold Star Adventures kind of on the side two and a half years ago. Um, and, and I did that because I was kind of experimenting with seed investing in the enterprise. Uh, a couple companies that had spun out of GoToMeeting, GoToMyPC in Santa Barbara uh, called RightScale, uh, which probably raised about $75 million, and Eucalyptus Software, um, which is an open source kind of hybrid cloud computing platform, uh, both came to me within a three month time span, <coughs> and they were only raising a million dollars. They said, I don't want anything more than a million bucks, that's all I need right now, and then after that, if I'm successful, I'll great, go raise five to 10 million. So, I ended up investing in Eucalyptus, put a small amount of money in, and within three or four months they raised five million, and then after that, I think they've raised $50 million uh, since that point in time. Uh, right scale, I ended up not investing in that because I was in the process of starting Bold Start with my partner, Elliot Durbin, who I think is over here somewhere. There he is. Um, and they ended up raising a million dollars, and then six months later, five million, and then a hundred million. And my brain kind of lit up and said, wow, you know what, I think it's time to create a seed fund focused solely on the enterprise. I think there's a big opportunity here. It used to be you raise three to five million dollars to develop your technology, another 10 million to go to market, and then you know after that if you're successful you end up raising another 20 to 25 million. That's what happened with Live Person. Um, we did that investment in the year 1998. Uh, I led the first round, it was a two million dollar round. The next round was 10 million dollars. You know what that was for? That was to build a data center. All right, so we end up signing shit, tons of leases with Sun Microsystems and Dell. You imagine why those companies don't exist anymore, really? Why? Because Amazon's out there uh, killing, you know, eating their lunch. Uh, in fact, Amazon just announced um, a virtual private cloud platform today, which is going to be big in the enterprise. So if the enterprise want to keep their data private and host it in the public atmosphere, I think it's going to be a huge, huge opportunity. So fast forward, uh, we decided to, to create an enterprise seed fund focus with the right size. So our first closing was at a $10 million size, and we're investing in uh, enterprise companies mostly, and we're putting $250,000 in the first round, typically co-investing with other, uh, we'll call them micro VCs or super angels. And our only goal in life is to help you get your Series A. And there's a lot that goes in between what a Series A looks like and everything else, we can talk about that. But um, we really align our interests with where you want to go. Great, so from an entrepreneur's perspective, what should they be looking for in terms of their seed round? I know, Stephen, today during some of the crowd intros, some people are looking for angel financing and potential seed funding. Yeah, the way uh, that Elliot and I think about it, we think of, think of ourselves as kind of river guides, right? You're, you're an entrepreneur, um, you want to raise a, a seed round, and you think about, what do I do next, right? And the way we think about it is like, look, here's your Series A, let's think about the milestones that you need to get there, 
and then let's work backwards from there. For an enterprise company, it could be getting your first 10 to 12 customers, your first 10 to 15 customers, um, and then figuring out how do you kind of reach that goal with the amount of engineers that you have, with what you need to develop, and getting it out to market. So what we like to do is kind of pre-wire the whole opportunity. During our due diligence process, we like to leverage our advisory board. We have 12 folks who actually have a piece of our profit uh, or part of our carry uh, in, in venture capital terms. And these are all entrepreneurs uh, that we've worked with over the years who have started companies and sold companies. Uh, and they include guys like um, Luke Lonergan, who is a CTO and co-founder of Green Plum. He's our big data guy. We've got a guy named Bernardo de Albigeria, who's at Citrix Online now. He's the first VP of marketing there solely responsible for scaling that company from one to $35 million in three years. So he's kind of our SaaS go-to-market guy. We've got some IT folks like Marty Broadbeck. He's the CTO at Pearson. He used to be the head of, head of enterprise architecture at Pfizer. So we really leverage these guys and say, hey, what are you seeing in the marketplace? Uh, what do you think of the startup? Uh, are there opportunities? And we try to pre-wire the whole thing so we can help you get your Series A done quickly. Great. And the press is having a field day right now, writing about the Series A crunch. So you're saying that you're focused on helping entrepreneurs achieve this. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you see, and how are you helping them prevent that? Uh, <laughs> there's one wise VC that once told me, uh, if dinner is being served, then you eat. So a lot of entrepreneurs will come to us and, and not raise enough capital. Uh, we only need 500000 and then we'll go out and raise another 500000 and then another 500000 But you know what? Raising money is not fun. Uh, Elliot and I just went through the process ourselves, raising money for a fund. It's very distracting. It takes a lot of time. So our suggestion is, once again, let's look at what milestones we think you need to hit. Why do we know that? Well, we've done so many seed investments. We've done, I guess, 12 in the past um, you know, two years, uh, actually 16 in the last two, two years. And before that, I've done you know, about 20 or 30. So we really kind of know what the market looks like, what our Series A partners uh, want to have from an investment perspective. And then we help you work backwards and say, you know what, maybe you should take one and a half million dollars instead of 500,000, or maybe you should take a million. Maybe you should not hire that VP of sales right now because you don't need that person. We expect you to get the ter first 10 to 15 customers yourselves uh, or using our network. So we try to figure out ways to really f efficiently use your capital and get to that next level. So that's a good point. You mentioned before that in the past it would take $10 million of funding just to build out a data center. Today, with it being much easier to build out your product and less costly, what should entrepreneurs be looking to do with their capital that they raise from you? Uh, typically, it's all about the team. Um, I mean, our typical profile is we like to fund product-driven engineering teams. So you're looking at three or four guys uh, who develop product. Why do we do that? Uh, one, <laughs> one is it's, uh, we want you to keep the crown jewels you know, at your company. Uh, two is uh, it's much more capital efficient. You don't really require capital to code at night, to code on the weekends to build your product. Um, and then three is, from that perspective, these folks are typically very passionate. I mean, they really want to see beyond just making the money, they want to get their product out to millions and millions of people. So, so number one is building the team up. I would say uh, that's the most important, important piece of that. Um, and then typically, you know, at some point in time, they might hire a one salesperson. You know, over time, once again, I wouldn't hire a VP of sales, but a salesperson to continue to help build your account and manage the existing customers that you have. So what's the sort of balance that an entrepreneur should have in terms of pushing out early stage traction, developing the product, before even speaking with you? Um, well, a lot of times I like to tell people, um, just go out and build something. All right, if you have an idea, I mean, back in the, in the mid-90s, it was basically like, all right, I've got an idea, I need five million bucks to build something. Well, guess what? <laughs> with the open source and cloud and everything else, there's a big gap between having an idea and actually getting something out to market. Just go build something. It, has, it doesn't have to be pretty. I know engineering-driven uh, user interfaces are not pretty, but make it functional. Show us that you can actually go from idea to actually having something in the market. And our typical profile is we've done many alpha-type investments, betas. Uh, Preact is one of our investments. Uh, I think they have, uh, Chris, what do you have, like 10 pilot customers up and running right now? Or? Yeah, we've got ballpark. 10 pilots. And during the diligence process, I think we helped you get three big ones during that process? Every referral you gave us for your due diligence yeah. ended up being pilot companies. Yeah, so, so that's kind of how we do things. In our diligence process, we, we don't want to waste your time. I mean, time is precious for everyone, and we just want to get right to the point. All right, let's get some real-world, on-the-ground feedback. Don't give me a Gartner Magic Quadrant. I don't give a crap about that. We can, we can pontificate about how big the market is going to be in 2018 and everything else, but at the end of the day, what you really want as an entrepreneur and as a VC is on-the-world feedback. So we're going to get you into customers. We're going to get you into strategic partners and go to guys who, who or, or women that look at this market every single day. 
So touching on the Gartner point, you're often chartering in ungartnered terrain, as I would say, and you're looking at the latest and greatest. How are you evaluating these opportunities? Um, yeah, well, if it's on the Gartner Magic Quadrant, then it's probably not interest, interesting to us. Um, Elliot and I are the product of Jesuit high school, so we had to take classical uh, Latin and Greek. So there's a term that we call, kind of our slogan or tagline is um, uh, Audentis Fortuna Uvat, which is in Latin it means uh, fortune favors the bold. So at the end of the day, every investment that we make and every entrepreneur that we meet, we want them to think about how are you going to create the next big thing. I mean, we're not in it to sell, you know, sell out at $20 million or $50 million. We want to create market-leading <coughs> next-generation platforms. And I think that's a big problem with New York. Everyone talks about Silicon Valley and Boston and everything else. Guess what? We don't have an EMC here. Okay? We don't have a Cisco here. That's all right. But I think people in this room, if we kind of think about it, instead of creating an incremental change, and if you want to think about orders of magnitude, and order, orders of magnitude change like Green Plum. Green Plum came to us and said, hey, I want to turn the data warehousing space upside down. I go, what do you mean by that? We want to create a Google-like computing platform clustering commodity servers and getting petabyte scale at one-tenth the price and 20x the performance. We said, great, there's no way you can do it. <laughs> so they went out and started building some stuff. We screwed up a few times. Um, and lo and behold, we ended up selling for a lot to EMC just about three years ago. So they're one of the first big data kind of platforms out there. And when we looked at the investment, what allowed us to take the risk was that the entrepreneur wanted to take the risk. They wanted to go after a big opportunity, which is Teradata. They wanted to create an orders of magnitude difference, in this case, bigger than 10x, greater than 10x difference. Um, and they made a really big impact in a short period of time. So those are the types of entrepreneurs that we want to fund. And we hope that uh, everyone in here has the audacity to step out and create something like that. So going after such big ideas and trying to really disrupt the market, I'm sure it's not always a smooth process. Have you had any memorable companies where you've invested in there were just several ups and downs along the way? Um, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> a a absolutely. I think failure is part of the process. Um, and the most important thing is learning from your mistakes. So even in, in the case of in Green Plum, I remember that uh, we had a board meeting. We hired a VP of sales. They hired, you know, their four territory managers and, you know, you had a sales guy paired with their sales engineer. So we had 10 salespeople from nothing after we had 10 beta customers. At the board meeting, the CEO and the founder come, come into the office and say, okay, guys, do you want the good news first or the bad news? And we just said, hey, give us the bad news. He said, look, um, we have our customers, but we realize that we can't scale. We can service our existing customers, but we can't scale beyond that. So we can either fly our plane with one wing and try to fix it as we go, or we can scrap everything and restart and rebuild from scratch. And then we said, okay, how much money is that going to take? <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up, uh, 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 our fund and, and some of the other investors ended up investing uh, along with the founder. The founder put $500,000 of his own money and put a mortgage on his house and said, okay, I'm going to put 500000 and we guys match him with another million. So he believed in his product so much, he, he, he put his house up for mortgage. We put, a, we put the other million bucks in. And uh, we re-architected the whole platform, fired the whole sales team. And six months later, we went out to market again with our new product, and we ended up uh, you know, doing what we did. And the point that I have to say is that too often, when entre entrepreneurs in their seed stage raise their funding, they say, hey, first guy I want to hire is a VP of sales. I say, stop. I say, do you know who you're selling to? Do you know what pain point you're solving for them? Do you know what value proposition that you have what is your repeatable sales process? Oh, uh, uh, okay, you know what? Don't hire a VP of sales right now because you're just going to waste a ton of money. Use it to learn more about your customer, and when you're ready, then you can hire that VP of sales. And that, I, that I think, is the number one biggest mistake that a lot of enterprise companies make is they think, just put the money in, hire the VP of sales guys, and instantly you have sales. That doesn't happen. <coughs> So how do you suggest to a lot of these early stage entrepreneurs that don't have a VP of sales yet that are targeting a big idea to actually penetrate the enterprise? Uh, well, from my perspective, um, being a CEO or being an entrepreneur is all about kind of your, your charisma and your ability to attract uh, talent and your ability to sell. And your ability to sell means your ability to sell <coughs> to bring engineers and team members in your company, but also uh, out in the real world. So um, my suggestion would be that if you can't get your first three or four customers yourself, then you shouldn't be you know, the CEO of a company, to be honest with you. You need to figure out how to network, 
use you know meetups like this, use companies like Data Hug or whatever <laughs> to go out and network, 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 network. Get out there and be able to sell your vision. All right, and then your investors. You should make sure that when you bring investors on board, every investor you bring on bring on board say, how are you going to help me accelerate to get to my Series A? How are you going to help me get new customers? How are you going to help me, you know, get my next VC in, into the next round? And that's the way you need to think about it. It's, a, it's an iterative process, but everyone here, even engineers, you need to know how to sell. I just put up a blog post, like, I don't blog anymore really because it's just too boring and too long, but <laughs> um, I put a blog post a, a few months ago about selling Cutco knives. I used to, um, I had a kid in the neighborhood, college kid, came to us and said, hey, uh, have you ever heard of Cutco knives? I said, absolutely, I used to sell Cutco cut knives, come on in. You know? so, um, so, you know, as I sat down going through the sales process, it was the same pitch that I went through 20 years ago, right? The same pitch, right? Cuts the penny in half and blah, 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 right? And then pulls out the spatula spreader. But the whole point was, um, it's very cheesy, but it's very interesting. Um, you've, got, you've got to sell knives, which everyone has, right? So you've got to compete against other knives out there. You've got to figure out how to network. So when the kid left, not only do we buy, you know, a pretty nice set, he asked for five referrals. I gave him five referrals. So every meeting you take, you know, make sure that you're always, always selling. Take referrals, you know, get leads, constantly, you know, figure out what the next steps are on the action items. And I think everyone in here, even if you're an engineer, you got to take some type of sales course or read books on selling because you're always selling. So talk to me a bit about what it was like to invest in New York in the mid-90s, and what do you see as the biggest differences today? Oh, wow. New York in the mid-90s was like a backwater place. I mean, <laughs> I remember we were out um, in, in the mid-90s. I was out at Harvard Management Company meeting with Peter Dolan. He's a legendary private equity investor at, at Harvard. And uh, we were telling him that we were going to create kind of a, a fund focused on New York City and technology companies. He basically laughed at us. And they looked us in the eye and said, okay. Sounds great. Give me five billion dollar IPOs that have come out of New York on the tech side. A silence in the room. All right? And so we had nothing to say, and that was it. That was the end of the meeting. All right, so fast forward today, it's what, 2013, 17 years later. We haven't had that billion dollar B2B enterprise marquee IPO. We've had companies like DoubleClick. You know, they did pretty well, but the, you know, it was an internet infrastructure company. 24-7 Media, I happened to be uh, in the first round of that company, which did very well. Live Person, which is probably pretty close. Most people don't know about it because it's a boring space, right? Chat, customer chat, but it's an $800 million market cap company. So I think what New York has to do right now is think about how do we create that next big thing. There are tons of great engineers coming into town. Um, <laughs> I, I also think about kind of the whole Willie Sutton quote, why'd you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Well, guess what? The money's in New York. I mean, why are the guys here from, from DataHog and Veritech and everything else? Is because, you know, what, I bet you New York is one of your first two sales hires, right, in terms of getting the enterprise out? Yeah, we just heard two here. Yeah. yeah, see, there you go. This is where the money is. So if the money's here, then building companies around here, I think, is a great opportunity. I think the mm -hmm. other thing that has changed is that when I was in the business in the mid-90s, the, the thinking was that enterprise technology could only come out of Silicon Valley that the sun only rose and said Silicon Valley, and if you weren't there, then you're a nothing. But guess what? Since the whole networking layer has been commoditized, the whole data center has been commoditized, which is the highest value opportunities today is kind of the application layer. And, that, and you can be anywhere for the application layer. In fact, I would argue that you should be closer to the customer for the application <coughs> layer than for the, the data center and the hardware. And I think that's the opportunity that we have here, is that mobile is changing everything, that you know Amazon EC2 has changed everything, and Building stuff on that application layer, I think, is really huge. And the value today is not only in the application layer, but as you saw in two of the three companies today, it's what you do with that data. I'll call that the smart data layer. So Preact, you know, one of our investments, Data Hug, they, what you do with that data and kind of how you help customers around that, I think, is is, is a great value. And you can be anywhere to the, to do that. You can be in New York, you can be in Europe, you can be anywhere. And actually, that touches on a large part of why I started the meetup here. Seeing that, as you mentioned, we have all the customers. We have financial services, media, advertising companies, tech companies. When you have that together with the fact of consumerization of IT going on, you have a bottoms-up approach to purchasing. Are you seeing an impact within your entrepreneurs that you're funding being able to penetrate enterprises easier and where people are not getting decisions from a CIO, but they're actually being empowered to make buying decisions? Uh, I mean, that, that's a huge trend. Um, I remember I was with Tony Scott, who at the time was the, the, the CTO of, of GM. Motors. This was in the mid 90s. 
and I was meeting with him in Detroit, looking over that Windy River, and it's kind of a ghost town. And he said, Ed, you know what? If I took every single meeting with every enterprise software company trying to sell to me, I would not do my job. I go, what do you mean? He's like, he's like, man, he's like, everyone's calling me all the time. I've got literally 300 vendors that I'm paying for right now, and if I took every meeting, I just wouldn't be able to have time. He said, so one of the things we're doing is consolidating our IT infrastructure, and we're just going whole hog, you know, just IBM. IBM everything or Cisco <coughs> everything. So the point is, is that people don't want to be have, have sales pushed to them anymore. They, they want to find things themselves. Mm -hmm. Google has unlocked that whole thing. So the Googleization of IT is basically, I find something, I search for it, and I want to download it. It's either open source, and I can use it right now, or, or SaaS, I can use it right now. So the New York example, um, you got Glenn and Mike here back at Handshake. We just invested those guys, um, I don't know, three or four months ago. And uh, they came to us and they said, holy crap, we've got tons and tons of sales right now. Just uh, how many guys were, were you when you when you first started? I mean, uh, how many customers? Yeah, how many, how many folks were in your company? Like four or five? Oh, yeah, like yeah, a handful. Like three or four just a handful. Maybe. And I don't think they raised any money and they came to us and they're on a pretty significant run rate from a, um, and what they're doing, by the way, is they're in a very unsexy industry. <laughs> they're, they're taking the old B2B catalog space and putting it on the iPad. Putting on the iPad, putting on Android, putting on the iPhone. So instead of lugging this big catalog around, if you're selling strollers or opso hand goods or anything else, you pull up this beautiful iPad, flip through it, and then take your orders right there. And um, very unsexy, but in our mind, it's sexy because you know what? It, it makes money. It's going after a $100 billion in industry. So, you know, it's not the best eye candy or anything, but these guys came up and they were going bottom up. And you could see their sales, you know, one salesperson would use it and be kind of the champion in the organization. And all of a sudden, five, and then 10, and then all of a sudden, it'd be like 30 people. And so when we sat down with these guys, they're trying to figure out, okay, I've got all these customers up, how do I take the one person or two, two people and expand it to five, 10, 30, 40, 50? And so I'm, we're seeing it left and right, and they didn't barely raise any money before they even got to that point. So for all of you out there, I challenge you to do what the Handshake guys did, is go out and build something, get some customers on board. <coughs> it is possible. It's absolutely possible. So what trends are you seeing today that really excite you? Um, let's see. Well, the whole uh, mobilization of the SaaS market. So <laughs> we call it SaaS 2.0. I, I, I've been around for so long. I was, I've been around when we invest in live person. It was called the ASP market, application service provider. I don't know if anyone remembers that name, but that's that's kind of all mouthful, you know. But uh, so now it's SaaS, right? So if you think about SaaS, SaaS was Salesforce basically taking um, SAP and all these other companies, and it was a desktop-based browser experience, right? So the question now, moving to SaaS 2.0, is how do you uh, make that a mobile experience? And as one of our entrepreneurs said, he uh, sold his company to Salesforce. He told Mark Benioff, slapping an HTML5 interface on top of Salesforce is not mobile, right? You've got to rethink things. You've got to be different about it, right? You've got to be smart. Think about the phone itself. The phone has an accelerator, uh, accelerometer in it. It's got GPS data. It's got a whole bunch of stuff. So if you're a sales guy, you don't want to just sit there and pump in fields when you land, you know, um, travel from New York to California. You want to land and you want to pull up an app and say, holy crap, these are your top 10 customers. Uh, this customer you haven't met with in two weeks, and boom and boom, set up the meetings and kind of go from there. So we're talking about creating intelligent filtering kind of at the mobile end. So we think kind of the mobilization of, uh, of the SaaS market is going to be a big play. It's not just slapping on, you know, web interfaces or throwing an app in the app store. Um, it's about intelligent filtering and smart data. Uh, the second pitch we think is big data is kind of passe in a way. I mean, I've been there, done that with Green Plum. Um, Great, now you can store everything really cheaply, right? So now what the hell do you do with that stuff, right? I mean, you can store everything in the world. Uh, I like to think that there's three certainties in life. It's uh, death, taxes, and the growth of data, right? So then the question really is, what the hell do you do with that data? How do you use that? How do you make money from it? And that's why companies like, you know, uh, Datahog and Preact and a bunch of other guys are out there trying to figure out how to mine that data and create something intelligent uh, with that. Um, and, you know, the third piece for us is kind of looking at We'll call this kind of our fun consumer bucket. Uh, about 20% of our investments are really focused on network effect type opportunities. So one of our uh, investments is called Indiegogo. And um, you know those guys just completed a pretty big round. They completed a $15 million round of funding last July from Insight Venture Partners and Kosla. We were the first money into that. So it's kind of like a Kickstarter crowdfunding platform. So we think those three trends are pretty big. Um, I also want to plug one other company that's doing well called Enterproid. Enterproid, uh, uh, is very kind to us because we actually sublease space from them. So you might think of the VC having a huge office and subleasing space to their uh, startups. We actually sublease space from Enterproid. 
We were in the seed round. They did a $15 million round with uh, Google Ventures and Qualcomm and Comcast. And what they're doing is, is solving a very real problem out there, which is um, the bring your own device market, right? Basically, everyone wants to bring their own smartphone into the enterprise. Enterprises are like, okay, I can't fight this trend anymore. So they have an app that almost, like, almost virtualizes your phone. So you can have two phones in one. Um, you click on the app, you're in the Morgan Stanley environment, and basically they can set policies. You can only download <coughs> such and such, every email, every uh, text is tracked. And then when your wife calls, your husband calls, you answer the phone, nothing's tracked. Uh, that company is doing uh, very well right now. They, they signed a deal with IBM Global Services. They're right here in New York. Uh, signed a deal with Verizon Wireless, which is reselling it. So it is really possible to create big opportunities out of New York that are in the enterprise space. Great. And Andrew Toy, actually, the CEO, demoed here. So if anyone wasn't at that event, I think it was last July, go on YouTube and type in uh, Enterprise, New York Enterprise Tech, and you can watch the video. It's a great demo. And last question before we open it up to the audience. Uh, so you've seen a lot, as I mentioned, consumerization of IT, people being empowered. You have meetups like this one that are, spot, that are uh, going on right now. And you have incubators and accelerators starting to target the enterprise. So the FinTech Innovation Lab does a great job focusing on financial services and basically connecting CIO level people with startups that are targeting financial services. What do you think that New York needs? What else, are, what else do we need here to really help get more companies that can have that billion dollar exit? I think, uh, well, everything that you're doing here, I think is, is awesome. I think uh, education, right? I think in terms of just having um, more workshops, uh, more accelerators just to teach folks that, um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest problems, to be honest with you, when I meet enterprise companies out of New York, is that there are a lot of great engineers here, there are a lot of great consulting companies that are here focused on serving financial services companies, et cetera. And a lot of these companies come out and they're very one customer focused, right? They come out and say, oh, but it's not only a software product, guys, it's you're 50% customizing everything everything you do. So I think uh, when, when you see kind of a road, roadblock for a lot of these enterprise companies in New York, it's finding good product management people, uh, good people from product marketing who really understand how to think about product, how to gather all the feedback and create something that everyone can use versus uh, one-off opportunities. Um, so, I mean, we spent a lot of time with companies trying to help them figure that, that process out. Great, so I'll start looking at Twitter, but in the meantime, does anyone in the audience have a question? But two questions. Tell me about two companies that you've invested and in failed, rather oh. than the successes. And the second <laughs> one, why as an enterprise investing company did you go for Indiegogo? Okay, so, so the, the first one is uh, a company that we invested in called StatusNet, which is in Montreal, Canada. Uh, we did the round with a couple other VCs. And basically they had an open source like Twitter platform. Um, and so the idea behind that was that corporations didn't want to have everything on Twitter. Um, this would also allow, like, Yammer was also uh, pricing very uh, Oracle-like, uh, very aggressively. And we were an alternative. So when we did the diligence, we looked at while they had thousands and thousands of downloads, they had large companies like SAP and Lockheed Martin kind of using it. And uh, what failed was that <laughs> these guys were, uh, we hired, we hired the, that company hired a, a sales, the VP of sales guy too early. They didn't figure out the repeatable sales process. And I think they're almost too beholden to the open source community <laughs> instead of really, uh, you know, it's a fine line between balancing out keeping the open source community happy and then also uh, being enterprise focused <coughs> and making money. Uh, because you can piss these, you know, piss your uh, your community off very quickly. Uh, Indiegogo, I said we are mostly enterprise folks. You look at our portfolio. Uh, as I said, 16 investments. Uh, I said 20% is for network effect type opportunities. So Indiegogo just happened to be a very very interesting platform in a in a huge market. So they fit our fortune favors the bold kind of opportunity. They're going after something really big, and uh, they've done very well so far. Despite Kickstarter being there. Not by Kickstarter being there, but by being a little different, right? There's different ways that they do the campaigns. They pay you, you know, even if you don't reach your goal. I and mean, there's a whole bunch of things that they did. But the CEO is very dynamic. Slava, he, he's awesome. And, uh, and he's done a great job. I mean, the one thing he did really well, to be honest with you, was pick one metric that all he cared about was, how can we help you, Slava? One metric, get me more campaigns. All right, so if you're a company, my question to you would be, what is that one metric that you can, uh, that you can think about every day, that you can th have every engineer, every salesman think about every day, and in his case was getting more mm -hmm. campaigns, and guess what? It worked. So the good part about you being quotable is that people are tweeting it, but it's <laughs> making it difficult to find questions, so let's find some more for you. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of opportunities do you see around the SharePoint Cloud? Uh, 2013, Office 365, App Store. Oh, uh, the, the SharePoint stuff? Hey, look, I... I <laughs> 
I think uh, Microsoft is kind of a hidden beast. Mm -hmm. I think they've done a very good job. I always look at Microsoft as turning a battleship around. You know, I, I remember when Bill Gates all of a sudden said the internet's important. Well, guess what? It was around for three years and shifted that battleship around this way. And so um, we got a lot of insight. One of our advisory board members is a guy named Mark Brown. He's the senior VP of Corp Dev and global head of M&A at Microsoft. Uh, so we get a lot of feedback from him in terms of kind of what's happening. Um, you know, I mean, Office is out there. It, it's kind of cracking away. We haven't spent, to be honest with you, we haven't spent a lot of time there. I mean, on the whole SharePoint side, I really see the rise of Yammer and Salesforce Chatter as kind of out there, uh, you know, taking a lot of market share right now. And I think Microsoft is trying to, with that Yammer purchase, I think is really doing a great job of trying to um, play into the whole new new game of SaaS. This side. So, uh, what do you think are the key metrics? for raising a Series A core enterprise company? Um, you know, it, it really depends on what your price point is, but uh, let's say you're doing like, um, I'm trying to think about like a fifty to $75,000 run rate per month, right? So I don't think about how much revenue you've done, but I'm thinking about fifty to seventy-five k per month. And as you know, the whole Series A crunch and all the other stuff, but um, I would kind of gear your head towards that perspective and figure out how do you get there and kind of work backwards. Um, I think that's a pretty, pretty safe metric. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> uh, so, give, uh, given the stage that your investment companies are at, um, how large are the typical enterprise customers? Can you scale for very large? Can this can those companies scale for very large enterprises, typically, or not? Um, it, it really depends because most of the stuff that we're doing is is less install kind of software at the premises. It's more SaaS based. So. Great example is uh, when Live Person. This is a great example, actually. Live Person. When we did that first ten million, the second ten million dollar round, uh, we had a couple of banks looking at us. We they said, "Great, chat sounds great, SaaS sounds great, but holy crap, let me spend a month. I've got to do uh, due diligence because I've got standards myself. I want to figure out if you're scalable. I want to figure out your security standards. I mean, they literally had to go in and check out our badges and figure out what the security standards were and kind of how how much uh, layer of security we had. That's not a question. And when Go Instant <coughs> started. Um, we funded it, and in 14 months, we exited Salesforce at a, at a pretty large number. And we signed up six or seven large banks. And guess what? The question was never about how scalable are you. It was never about how secure are you. Because we said, look, there's Amazon. I think they're pretty scalable. I think they're pretty secure. It was more focused on what are you doing for me? How are you solving my problems? And everything else. So I think the world has changed significantly, which is why I think it's a great time to, be, to start an enterprise company and to actually be an enterprise seed fund. I mean, I'm, I'm very excited right now about that. Found a question on Twitter from at NYC Katie. Uh, how have you seen the role of women, both as investors and entrepreneurs, in tech change since you started in VC? Um, honestly, I, I think there's, I want to see more women entrepreneurs out there, to be honest with you. Uh, we're seeing more and more out there. I mean, Elliot and I, have, I've met a few recently. Uh, uh, Amy, where's Amy? Amy's over here. She's a kick-ass SaaS salesperson who's getting recruited by a ton of folks. So if you need someone, talk to Amy. She's actually been very helpful to us with some of our portfolio companies in terms of uh, coaching them through kind of the sales process, including Ghoulie over there. Um, so so I, think it, I think it's a great opportunity for women and it's a you know, democratized environment. So I, I think we should encourage that. Back to the crowd. What's your view on strategic investors, kind of at an A round or a seed round even? They seem to get more and more active the big <laughs> companies, you know? Oh man, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'd like to see them in the seed round, uh, but maybe in an A round they could be interesting. And I always view strategic investors as kind of the Switzerland approach. If you're going to bring in a strategic investor, make sure that it doesn't limit your options for other strategic investors or acquirers in the future. Uh, like let's say, for example, you create a mobile app and Verizon Wireless invests in your company, then you're probably going to close off options for AT&T and some of the other competitors. So you got to think thoughtfully about your strategic investor, number one. Number two is, you have to think about how uh, much of a pain in the ass they will be, right? Because in certain board meetings, for example, we'll go through strategic discussions and we'll have to ha excuse the strategic investor from that meeting to make sure that they're not um, you know, privy to some information from competitors and things like that. So it can be a great thing, to be honest with you, but you just have to be very careful about how you manage that. How do you overcome uh, the perception, which is actually the correct one, that smaller companies, even with a great product, are risk, risky to buy from and because we, they don't have enough support infrastructure, they don't have enough uh, attraction uh, from earlier clients. How do small companies can overcome 
Well, I will answer the question, uh, and then I'm going to ask Jonathan to answer the question because he's on the buy side as well. So um, we have a venture partner named Steve Schuett who has a, a firm called Cresting Wave. And Cresting Wave's sole ex existence is to, is to be a sales acceleration. So he typically works with technology companies, um, and he's typically their first outsourced salesperson. So instead of hiring a guy in New York, he hires Steve. He has uh, 200, 300 CIOs that he works with, standing meetings with them, and they say, Steve, I only want to see the emerging companies. I want to see the new technologies because I know today that given the fact that you've got Amazon and everything else, scalability, security is not a question. I just want to make sure that they're well-funded enough uh, <coughs> with the right investors. So we'll work with Steve. We'll send companies five to ten uh, a month. Uh, Marty Broadback from Pearson will have to meet with folks, and he's not afraid to work with. So it really depends. You've got to make sure you meet with the, the right folks because <coughs> it's become less and less of a barrier today than it was you know, 15 years ago. Another check mark for enterprise companies being a great, great opportunity. Nice. Yeah, and actually to add on to that, uh, it's important to take a holistic approach of your company. So if right now you have a lot of smaller customers, you can build that up to maybe land that one bigger customer but in a less risky area for them. So focus, instead of trying to get something firm-wide, something within one division of theirs. And even within your own company, maybe your revenue isn't that big, but if you can look for investment, you'll have strength on the balance sheet that'll at least offset the risk and guarantee a little more runway. So they have a specific group at Morgan Stanley looking at startups specifically because they know that, you know, people, uh, buyers expect startups to create innovative breakthrough solutions. They don't want startups to create whole platform, whole end-to-end -end solutions. So leave that for IBM and CA. So if you're going to come to us as an enterprise startup, don't tell me you're creating an end-to-end -end solution. I want to hear about the innovative breakthrough solution that you have because that's what enterprise buyers will, will look for from you. I'm curious about that. The timing of your investment and the, your positioning as a seed investor, as a VC. Because it seems that B2B is bec becoming more popular, so the big VCs are not bringing money into uh, that space. And the cycle is shorter, as you said, to develop the company. So you think that you'd be in this fair amount of angel investment. Do you think you'd be squeezed because the angel put money and then the A round come faster and you don't have a step? Do you find that a problem? Maybe, or? Um, you know, we don't find it a problem uh, right now. So typically, as I said, this is what we really focus on. And we'd like to develop relationships with the entrepreneurs. So if we add value to the entrepreneurs, there's always room uh, for us to invest uh, not only our pro rata but more in the next round, number one. And number two is a lot of times we will pre-wire the whole thing and we'll literally put together a list of 10 VCs which we think will be perfect for them. And by the way, they happen to be our friends. So say, hey, here you go. Take a look at these guys. We're very excited about them. And we'll make sure we reserve our allocation from that perspective. So you That's do convertible debt uh, we do a lot of convertible notes. Uh, it's very fast, very quick. We like to do it with a cap. Um, and, and we like companies to not price for perfection. You know, it may sound self-serving, but as a, as, a, as a seed investor and as a seed entrepreneur, you don't want to put too high a valuation on you because then when you try to raise your Series A, um, there's a high likelihood that you might take a big hit on the valuation, right? So you want to price it at a, at a it's like selling a house. You don't want to sell it at your highest price. You want to bring as many people in the door as possible and then that, that can increase your value. So we typically like to have a cap on the note as well. That is, that is very reasonable. Another question from Twitter. Eli Bozeman, lots of great business types in New York, but still short on devs. Any thoughts on how to best validate an idea without learning to code? Oh, so, you know, there, there, I would come to these technology meetups. How many, how many engineers are out here right now in this technology meetup? Great. And uh, I would imagine that if someone like this comes to a tech meetup and say, hey, I've got a great idea, I'm looking for engineers, there's more and more opportunities for them. So my answer would be go out and network, right? Go out and network, go out and find them. They're out there, it's more, it, it's, it's easier today to reach these folks than it was 15 years ago. It was very hard 15 years ago to reach these folks. So if you can't network, then you're not gonna start a company, you're not gonna get customers, you're not gonna get venture funding, that's for sure. And I think something to add to that is a lot of engineers may be annoyed by let's say a 10 to 1, a 30 to 1 ratio of business people targeting them, hey, I have a great idea. But the more on the business side you can do to validate it, whether it's through prototyping software to show off something, whether it's through working out your marketing strategy, any business development opportunities, the more that you can do to show that you've actually thought through the idea and are ready to basically have it coded is a way to differentiate yourself from everyone else who's saying, hey, developer, come work with me. Uh, when starting up in the absence of, uh, if you're a business guy looking to start something up, what do you think of a business guy uh, teaming up with another business guy? <laughs> well, I've uh, had a company that came in about two months ago, and there are four VPs, and then they're outsourcing their development, and then they have this burn rate that was exorbitant. And so, you know, as I said, once again, the profile that Elliot and I use and typically works is that 
we want engineers, 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 engineers. It could be one business guy, but I want people that build and code because you know, the worst case, they can flip on a dime, switch on a dime in terms of what direction to go. And look, the worst case scenario is if things don't work out, because not everything works out, you can at least sell uh, you know, some of the assets and, and people will pick up the engineers. It's hard for large companies to hire really smart engineers, particularly in the mobile side. That's kind of like the backboard out there. So um, I'm, I'm, we're really engineering focused. I mean, that, that's where you gotta be. How many kind of actively hire exits have you had then? Uh, we've had, uh, just in the last two and a half years, of the, well actually we had four exits that were nice and then one was an acquire, so it's five exits. So like I heard people talking in the Valley to build that in as their risk premium, so they go like, okay, they got how many engineers yet? Seven, okay, seven by 1.5 million. Yeah, exactly, so, so people think about a million dollars yeah. per engineer, yeah. but they've got to be really solid. Yeah. Time for one more. Quick, um, when people come to you with no ideas, are you expecting them to have skin in the game, to be throwing in 50 or 100K? Does that give them more? Does that give you a better listening? To say, if he's putting 100k into this idea, then I think we should be doing the same. It, it, once again, we are very engineering focused. So typically, three or four engineers will come in and say, "Look what I've been building so far," and we don't really ask about how much money they they, they put in because they put the time and sweat equity, and they actually have something to show us. Um, so, having money in the in the opportunity is is less interesting to us than having actually put something together and put a lot of time and effort into talking to customers and actually building something. So once again, we're, we're looking for builders, doers, and makers, um, and, and how much they fund is, is really uh, not relevant to us, to be honest with you, because we know you're putting your sweat equity and your time into, into the opportunity. Great. Everyone, let's give a round of applause for that. And also, I think we should give one to John as well.